today I would like to speak about the maturity of the believer, um, embracing a missional attitude. Maturity is defined as full development or perfected condition. Every Christian uh, must work to mature in the faith. Another way maturity is defined is the word rightness. Rightness is like a fruit that's ready to be eaten. So we as believers must mature to be a fruit that's ready to be presented uh, to God. Every Christian must work to mature in the faith. Every church must work to mature into faith. And today I want to discuss the four mindsets on the path to maturity and developing a missional attitude. Mission has four definition. Each one fits very well. A mission is a group or committee of persons sent to a foreign country to conduct negotiations, establish relations, provide scientific and technical assistance or the like. Also dictionary says that mission is the business with which such a group is charged. It says mission is any important task or duty that is assigned, allotted, or self-imposed. An important goal or purpose that is accompanied by a strong conviction or calling or vocation. We, the people of faith, have a Christian mission. We have a charge. And that charge is to seek and save the lost and bring the broken to Christ where they can find healing and eternal life. However, sometimes, sometimes Christians forget the mission. Sometimes they never realize the mission. But until you make your life about the mission of Christ, maturity has not been reached. Therefore, today my sermon is going to look at the maturity of the believer and embracing the missional attitude. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, come to me all. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to talk about the first stage in our journey to maturation, and the first stage is the me stage. See, when we first come to Jesus, it's because of what we need, it's because of what we want as individuals. That's true. Okay? This is the very basic floor stage of coming to Jesus. It's what I want is what I need. I come to Jesus because I want to be healed. I come because I want to be fed. I come because I want to please my parents. I want to please my grandparents. I come because I want a relationship with God. I come because I want to be successful. I come because I want to go to heaven. I come because I want to grow. I come because I want to be transformed. I come because I want my family to be close to God and my children. I come because I want to prosper in the Lord. Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these things that I just named. But I want you to see that at the center of them is me. It's the me stage. It's, it's what can I get out of coming to Jesus. Jesus, I want you to heal somebody I love. I want you to heal me. I want you to feed me. I want you to show me the way. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I, 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 me, me, me. Okay? The self is at the center. Now, sadly, if, if one never grows out of the me stage, it can morph. It can morph, and it can become, I want my worship preferences. I want my age demographic. I want only my gender and leadership. I want my preferences to rule. I want my opinions to be taken most seriously. It morphs into something that's ugly. It's okay to come to Jesus because of what you need as an individual. But Jesus doesn't want you to stay where you started. Jesus wants us to grow from that place and become missionally minded. We've got to grow from the me stage into the we stage. And in the we stage, if you grow, 
you begin to care about your Christian community. You care about what's good for us, what's good for the we, what's best for we. Why did the early church grow so much? That's what they were known for the most was their rapid growth. According to scholars like N.T. Wright, they were known for their rapid growth. The reason why they grew so much was because they put the we before the me. The Bible teaches us in Acts 2, 43, it says, All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent time together in the temple, they broke bread at home. They ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, and day by day, it says, and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. When we enter into the we stage of maturity, it's no longer about the me, but it's about the collective body. I'm no longer concerned with just myself getting to heaven. But now I sing when we all get to heaven. I don't just care about myself being happy over there. But now I sing everybody will be happy over there. It's no longer about my needs alone being met. Because if I find a piece of bread, I'm going to bring it to my fellowship so that we all can eat. You can see here in Acts 2, 43 and 47 that the early church enjoyed being with one another. It said that they got together often, daily. It said they took care of one another. They sold their possessions and parted them amongst those who had need. It said that they fed each other and they ate together. And it wasn't begrudgingly. It wasn't like, why are you calling me to lunch? You must want to talk about something. Something's going on. You must be upset. Why are we going to lunch? Why you want to eat with me? Something must be going wrong. I must have made you mad. I must have offended you. Why? No, it wasn't that. It was they ate together daily with glad and generous hearts. They enjoyed each other's company. Why? Because they cared about the we. The Bible says... That because of this, because they were like this, that the Lord added to their number daily. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a community like that? Jesus told us that the world will know that we are his disciples by how much we love each other. We show that we are the disciples of Christ. Not by how much we know. Not by how fancy we speak. It doesn't matter if we got a PhD or no HD. It says that the world shall know that we are Christ's disciples by how much we love one another. If a church wants God to add to their numbers daily, it cannot stay in the me stage. It must enter into the we stage where people come and see that we are a place of love. They feel the love and they want to have that love for themselves. It's like the, you know, folks living in the world and the experience in the world and the brutality in the world and the chaos of the world. People ask themselves like the old uh, Donna Hathaway and Roberta Flex on, they say, Where is the love in the world? Turn on the news. You ask, where is the love? Right? The love is here. That's where the love is. The love is here. And the world will know that we are Christ's disciples by being a place that we love each other, where we have put we before the me. We have taken that M and turned it upside down on his head and made it about we. Because that's what this world wants. This world wants us to get so caught up in the me and the selfishness of the world and the capitalistic vulturism of the world where we're destroying each other and seeking to just get over on everybody. But see, the church is a place that counters the philosophy of the world. 
where we say that here, we're not running away with the selfishness of the world, but here we care about we together. And that brings me to the next stage, which is the them stage. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which Reverend Pennington read so eloquently, it says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I need you all to understand for a minute. We can just talk, talk a little bit about this at, for this moment. I need you all to understand that when Jesus gave this commission that we call the Great Commission, that it was rather radical. You see, the Hebrew people, they saw the world split up into two groups. One group was us, us, the Hebrew people, the, the, the lineage of Abraham, us. And then the other group was them. In other words, the Gentiles. See, what the, gent what the term Gentile means in their original language is the others, the others. Some, some say the other, the other nations, but really it means the other and nations is implied, but the others, the other nations. So the way when, we, when they see them called Gentiles, they're saying them, them, the others, the others. Uh, I, re I remember uh, when my daughter was born, we did a photo shoot with a woman who practiced the Jewish faith. And after we did the photo shoot, she, uh, she was telling me that she had to get the pictures to me a little later because, because Passover was coming. So I began to talk to her all about Passover. And I asked her, you know, who's going to cry out for Elijah? I asked her all these questions. And she was just shocked that I knew. She said, I'm surprised to hear so a person, I'm surprised to hear a Gentile knows all of this stuff. And I was like, oh, crap. Oh, <laughs> the Gentile, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, I had explained to her my background and my studies and everything, but I still was kind of shocked because when she said it, I felt it was like she was saying, the others know this. It kind of shocked me. And I'm respectful to her religion, but just... I never heard somebody refer to me like that, right? It shot me. So I, I'm, I'm grafted in, you know what I'm saying? We're grafted in. That's how I believe in my, as a Christian, but in her faith system, she sees it different. And that shot me, the others. And see, that's why what Jesus is saying here and the Great Commission is so radical. Because Jesus, Jesus made it clear in his ministry that he came to save the Jews, but he also said, I'm coming to save the Gentiles as well. And in the Great Commission, we find Jesus is challenging the insular ways that the religious establishment operated in those days. That there's us, and then there's them. And unfortunately, the religious establishment still looks at the world like this. But what's Jesus really saying to us? What's he saying about this us and them attitude? The us, holy, sanctified, set apart, them, sinners, wicked, evil. This is why Jesus and the scribes, this is why Jesus challenged the scribes and the Pharisees when they saw Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners, they didn't like it. But they, they didn't understand that Jesus was concerned about them. Do you hear me? When they saw Jesus eating with those tax collectors and sinners, they pointed the finger at him. They tried to wag the finger, but they didn't understand that Jesus was concerned about them. Being missional is following Jesus. It's not new with the ministry of Jesus. The prophets asked the people of both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom to be a cistern that flows living waters to the rest of the world, to go and teach the beauty of Yahweh all over the world. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. In other words, go, therefore, and make a brother and a sister out of those folks who you call them 
Go, therefore, and make a brother and a sister out of those people who you say are the others. Go, therefore, and make a brother and a sister out of them. In other words, the wall, the curtain of hostility was broken down that separated people with this us and them mentality. Jesus says, go to those people who you felt were disgusting because of how they ate and make them your brother and your sister. Jesus says, go to those people who you felt were barbaric because they didn't practice circumcision and make them your brother and your sister. Go to those people who you felt were under condemnation because they didn't practice the Sabbath and make them your brother and your sister. Make them disciples of me. Go get them. The them mentality realizes that everything we do is missional. Are, are, are y'all still with me? Are you still with me in the live stream? If you're, if you're still trekking with the live stream, type amen. Can it be see amen? Shoot me a thumbs up. I just want to know if they're with me in the live stream too. All right. Thank you, Brother Ken, for the thumbs up. Yeah, thank you. Because I want to make sure that we're with this before I make my next point. That when we embrace this missional attitude, and now we started with me, and then and, and then we cared about we, and now we're caring about them, we're going to see everything we do as missional. Sunday morning worship is not about my preferences. It's about how we can bring them to Christ. All my amen stop, Sister Robinson. Sunday morning worship is not about my purposes anymore. It's about how we can bring them to Christ. Our outreach, we don't do outreach to make ourselves feel good. It's not about ourselves. It's to bring them to Christ. Our fellowship opportunities that we have, that we enjoy. It's not just for us to have a good time. It's for us to bring them to Christ. When you have a them mentality, you don't speak a gospel word against the church family. Because you know that when you do, it will discourage them from following Christ. When you have a them mentality, you are willing to forgive and move on from conflicts and misunderstandings because you don't want to bring shame to the body of Christ and discourage them from following Christ. Brothers and sisters, even our funerals should be missional. That's right. We should all want the kind of funeral that encourages those living, still living in this physical world to see our example of following Christ and making them us. We should all want the kind of funeral where them are convicted by our lives. And they say at our funeral that I want to follow Christ like she did. I want to follow Christ like he did. That's the kind of person I want to be. I see God's blessing on their life and they come out of our funeral saying, I'm ready to give my life to God. Even our funerals are missional. Once we have a missional focus and we realize that we are to make them disciples and we start to focus on making them us, that's our final stage that we're talking about today. We start focusing on making them us which means that it will require our hospitality, love, care, and kindness. As Reverend Pennington read so eloquently, Jeremiah 31, 34 says, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We all know what it's like, the feeling of being somewhere and treated like you do not belong there. You see, when God blesses our church with new members and with children, both in age and in the faith, we must go out of our way to make them feel welcome, comfortable, and a part of our family. I remember visiting a little rural church 
in Arkansas. Yeah, it wasn't little. It was a rural church, but it wasn't little. It was a large church, actually. It had about 600 people in both services. And there weren't too many people there who, who looked like me and my wife. And I remember me and my wife going to visit this church, and I remember, I remember people staring at us. They're just staring at us. And, you know, when people stare at me, I just speak to them. They stare at me, I speak to them. Hey, how you doing? And they look the other way, you know. They look the other way. I remember going through this church with 600 people in attendance in that Sunday morning, 400, 600 people. I remember going in, sitting down, listening to the sermon, getting out, me and my wife leaving, and not being greeted by one single person. Nobody asking me who we were, where we come from. Can I get to know you? Can I be a friend to you? And I remember getting in the car and just feeling like I was not welcomed at that church. That is not the way anybody should feel when they go into the church of the Lord. Amen. They should come out saying that I cannot wait to get back around those people. Those people truly are a loving, kind group. There must be something to this Jesus because of how these people who praise him behave. The Bible teaches us over and over to welcome the stranger. Hospitality is a key tenet of the faith. When God sends us them, we must make them us. When God sends us them, we must make them us. When God sends us, then we must make them us. We take the disciple-making agenda to the very ends of the earth. There is no one in our city who is out of the reach of Christ. You know why? Because Second Baptist is in this city. Yes, yes, yes. I believe that it's time for a paradigm shift. It's time to realize that the faith is not given to us to hoard. The faith is not given to us to make us feel better than someone else or to create a class system for ourselves. The faith is not given to us to make us feel high, high off of our very worship style preferences. Jesus Christ did not die on the cruel cross of Calvary to be your personal assistant. Christ did not come to earth to create people to sit on a high place and detach themselves from the rest of the world. Christ did not minister on the earth so that we could all create our own little empires. The my attitude is killing the church in America. The me attitude is destroying the witness. Me, 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 I, 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 my, 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 I, I, me, me, I, I, me, me, my, my, I, me. It's time to bury the selfishness. It's time to bury gross individualism and equip ourselves with a holy collectivist attitude. As Galatians 6.10 says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. What does God want? God wants us to make disciples People willing to challenge the greedy, selfish agenda of the world and reject it with its notions. And instead, embracing the community of God. We need to get from me and turn that M upside down and care about we. The world is so hateful. The world is so hateful. And the church has an opportunity to be different than the world, mm -hmm. to be a loving place, which is an attractant all by itself. When you learn to love each other, when you learn to love each other, the world knows that we are Christ's disciples. We make more disciples as we love each other, and we make more disciples and we make disciples that make disciples. And we make disciples that make disciples. These disciples that we make are committed to taking this world with all of its selfishness and me, me, me-isms and turning it into us, us, us. We bring people together 
We are the vanguard of Christ. This is the mission. We are commissioned by Jesus Christ. Onward, Christian soldier. Yeah. Onward, Christ follower. Onward, you believer. Onward, you friend to the broken. Onward, you seeker of the lost. Onward, you caregiver of the harm and the hurt. Onward, Second Baptist Church of the Christ. Onward, onward, onward. Second Baptist. Ain't no stopping us now. We are on the move. Love it. Love it. If you are in need of a church home, why not make Second Baptist yeah. at home? Yeah. The doors of the church are open. Amen. God bless you.